Them trying to offer a commentary on what it should or shouldn't be doesn't justify the evil action that they take in the movie. That's the point here. And it's because it is a commentary on the evil that is abortion. Here's the difference, though. They didn't perform an abortion on screen to illustrate why that is bad. The difference in this film with Cuties is they actually engaged in sexual exploitation and making the girls do provocative things in order to illustrate this. That's why it's wrong. <laughs> Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Here's the deal. When it comes to Cuties, the movie that is now on Netflix that is drawing all kinds of criticism, rightfully so, because it has 11-year-old girls, actors and actresses that are actually 11. They're not just playing 11-year-old characters. They are actually 11-year-old actresses. Playing girls that are dressed and dancing in a, a very sexually provocative way. I'm sure that you know about the story. I've had a lot of people ask my opinion on it, what my take is, that kind of thing. And that's understandable. I mean, this is a Christian show. This is something that specifically relates to politics and morals. And so I get it. The reason I haven't commented on it so far is because I haven't seen it. And I've been debating back and forth in my own head, is it okay for me to do commentary on this thing even though I haven't seen it? And, of course, the logical answer to that that I would normally do is anything that I don't want to comment on until I've seen it, I just watch it. That's my go-to answer. It's the reason that we play so many clips. It's the reason we play so many clips and, and try to play them, you know, longer than most shows do to add the full context. But I cannot bring myself to watch this movie for a couple of reasons. First of all, I canceled my Netflix subscription a long time ago. <laughs> uh, the whole gay Jesus thing and trying to boycott the state of Georgia over their heartbeat bill, like that, there was too much already going on with Netflix for me to hang on to it. Now, do I think you're a horrible person if you haven't canceled your Netflix so far? No, not necessarily. But I just looked at the content that was being put out, the kind of company that they were, the values that they stood for, and I was like, I can't continue to give my money to these people. That was my choice. I don't begrudge you if you made a different one. So that's the first reason that I haven't watched it, is I don't want to pay this company specifically so that I can watch this documentary that I believe it would be the only reason that I bought it. And so I don't want to do that. I guess I could borrow somebody else's Netflix and watch it, but I don't really you know, favor doing that either, asking someone, hey, can I borrow your Netflix account so I can watch the movie with, you know, half-naked 11-year-old girls humping the floor? That's not a conversation I want to have with another person, and I think you can understand why. But even if that were not the case, even if I still had a Netflix account, I still had access to it, all of that, I still couldn't watch it because I've seen some really gruesome stuff in my time as a news person. I mean, I have watched terrorist behead a person with a knife and not like a, a clean cut like you see in a guillotine in a movie. I mean like a rusty jagged knife with the person squirming and, and seizuring and, and all of this stuff. I've seen some brutal, awful stuff. But I have to tell you, when it comes to disturbing, little kids are, are something that just kind of gets to me. And, and the idea that somebody would be going out there and exploiting these little girls I don't think I can subject myself to watching that. I just can't. I, I, you know, there are people out there that have, and they, they said that, you know, it made them cringe and they didn't want to watch it, but they felt like they had to, to be able to comment on it. And so I, I totally respect the fact that they were able to do that. If they were doing it specifically to offer a commentary, I know that, uh, I believe it was, was Crowder, Steven Crowder with the blaze that, was saying that he watched it and he was looking over his shoulder the whole time thinking, is the FBI going to bust in here and, and arrest me for this? Because he, he said it's basically child porn and it was really, really hard for him to watch. He had to cut it off several times. And so there are people that have watched through this and have offered commentary on it. Uh, I, I can't really, to, to some degree, I feel like I can't really offer a full commentary on it just because I was not able to watch it. But the newest piece of news in this particular story is that the director, uh, my, my, uh, Mona, my Mona Decor, I believe is the way to pronounce her name. It's French and there's like 19 unnecessary vowels in it. So, you know, I mean, you've seen LSU fans, you know, 
if it's a French word, it has 19 unnecessary letters in it that are silent or combined with another one to make a completely different sound. Nothing in the French language makes sense. And I'm saying that as an English speaking person, nothing in our language makes sense either. But with them, they just have a whole bunch of unnecessary uh, letters and vowels in their words for no reason. Anyway, so she's the director and she actually has said that it was intended as a commentary on the hypersexualization of really young people and that it should not be viewed as trying to create some kind of softcore child porn or whatever, that it was specifically intended to act as a foil, as a commentary to that and try to say that actually us over-sexualizing our children is a bad thing and that over-sexualizing our culture bleeds over into those that are not supposed to be sexualized and it has an effect on them because there are all these little girls that, for example, are, you know, they don't really understand sex and they don't understand how sexual and provocative the dances they are doing are. They're just watching adults and they're like, okay, they're doing this and this is getting them all their likes. And so it's also partially a commentary on social media. Therefore, we should imitate them and do the kinds of things that they are doing because that is what is getting them likes. And even though adult people that have the ability to do this, even though it's an immoral decision, of course, people like Beyonce and whatever the, the girl is that did that video, uh, Cardi B, Cardi B, uh, the, the one that did the recent video that's got kind of similar imagery with all adult women, that there is a bleed over effect that young girls see these people uh, see people that to, in their mind are role models and people that they want to be like, that society loves them and thinks they're fabulous. And so they want a similar attention. They will do things for attention, not even realizing how sexual they are being or how provocative it is or how dangerous it is to evoke that kind of imagery in people that would be predatory towards them. And so I don't want to say through no fault of their own, but, you know, somewhat through no fault of their own, because they are minors, their brains aren't fully developed, and they haven't developed the judgment to be able to filter these kinds of things out. Um, partially through this, the message of the film is sort of suggesting that these girls are kind of caught up in this toxic culture where they're just doing things that they think will get them likes, which leads them to do things that they should not be doing. Uh, that's not really how Netflix build the film. Not only with the original poster, with the, the very sexualized uh, view of that, but also in the, the, the blurb that they wrote about the movie talking about how it's basically a, a journey with a young girl who's living in a conservative family. By the way, I love how they put conservative. They don't mention that the family is conservative because they're Muslim. They're a, a Muslim family living in France. Uh, but they, they refer to it as a conservative. And so they, they basically talk about it like, oh, these poor repressed girls are just living in a, a super conservative uh, home where the, you know, the parents are ogres and uh, they don't let them do anything. And so the girls just break free and express themselves. That's how Netflix build the film. But the film itself, at least according to Ben Shapiro's commentary on it, it really doesn't take that direction. I mean, yes, all of that happens, but the message sort of at the end of it is that they realized that they had made a mistake, that they were sexualizing themselves and didn't realize that what they were doing was kind of horrifying and the adults sort of rush in and try to stop them. And so based on what he was saying, the message of the film is slightly different than the way it was billed and marketed by Netflix. So that means that we can look at this and say that there are several things that, that we can look at that can all be true at the same time. First, Netflix specifically did try to market this as, hey, here's these super hypersexualized young girls here for your viewing pleasure, even though that wasn't the way that the movie originally intended it. The second thing is that just because this thing, this thing may actually really be a legitimate attempt at commentary, that the director really was trying to send out a message that hypersexualizing children is a bad thing. But here's the third thing, and this is the thing that really makes all the difference in this story. The third thing is that just because it is a commentary does not mean that it is not in and of itself by its own nature and what it shows incredibly provocative and exploitive of these little girls. So good intention is not a license to do whatever you want. 
there are lots of things that were well-intended that yielded bad results, and that the good-intended people, though they had no malicious intent in their heart, should have known better. I mean, there is a, a myriad of th examples of this throughout history. For example, Mao Zedong and his Great Leap Forward. Now, I think that Mao Zedong was a horrible tyrant that was primarily concerned with his own power, but you could at least make the case, even though I think that it's wrong, you could make the case that he was well-intended in his Great Leap Forward. Now, that wound up systematically starving millions of people, to which, after about two years of trying it, he finally goes, yeah, maybe that wasn't such a great idea. But the point is, the good intent of Mao Zedong did not negate the fact that people were starving to death under his policies. And this is true of a lot of people in the political realm when you're talking about socialist movements. They really do intend good things. They really do think that they're helping people. They really do think that people will be better off if their policies are intended. Doesn't matter. No amount of good intention will negate the fact that people can die as a result of socialism, and 100,000 of them did in the 20th century. Now, there were some people that were more sinister than others that implemented socialist policies, but my point in all of this is, just because the director of this film may have very much legitimately intended for this to be viewed as a commentary and as a repudiation of sexualization of kids, showing the sexualization of kids in such a obvious and provocative way does not mean that those little girls in the movie were not exploited in the process of doing this. The Hollywood Reporter actually gives this quote, and this is her defending the movie that she made here. So this is, again, the director of Cuties, uh, Maya, Maya Moa Decor. And she says this, quote, It's bold, it's feminist, but it's important and necessary to create debate and find solutions. For me as an artist, for politicians and parents, it's a real issue, the director argued. Decor also defended cuties for allowing black and brown people to see themselves on the big screen. It's important to see someone like you on screen and to grow up with a lot of possibilities. So, of course, diversity and inclusion have to be keys to progress our cinema, she argued. The first words out of her mouth when asking about this is she said, well, it's bold. Yeah, well, lots of things are bold. Bold is not necessarily good. Bold can be good. We are commanded in the scripture to be bold when professing the gospel of Christ. That is certainly an example of how boldness can be good. I pray for boldness on a very regular basis because it's something that sometimes I struggle with. I know that's hard to believe, me being a radio host, but really it is. It's something that I have to pray for. Just because something is bold does not mean that it is right. It has to be coupled with that which is good. Lots of people have done very bold things, and it wound up being really terrible. For example, if you're a, and we're going to get into this in a second, unfortunately, like with California's new law, if you are a 40, 50-year-old man, and you start trying to romance a 14-year-old, that's bold. Not a good thing. And so, you know, this whole thing, well, it's, it's very bold, it's per yeah, that, that's not a point in its favor. You're not really addressing the core issue that everybody is talking about here. The, the second part of this is, I think she is correct in the sense that it is feminist. When she says that it's a feminist movie, I don't disagree with that. I think that she's 100% right on that, because if you're talking about, now, classical feminism, no, it's the exact opposite of classical feminism. But if we're talking about fourth-wave feminism, the modern idea of feminism, I think that she's actually 100% on the mark when she says that it is feminist, because remember that the only virtue in modern day feminism is that both people give their consent and basically it's okay to act like a whore as long as it's, you know, something that you're choosing and you're in control of. As long as it's not the man that's getting something out of it, as long as it's not the man that is in control of this. This is one of the craziest things that I've ever seen. Somehow men convince feminists that it was empowering to have lots of sex with men without any kind of commitment. I never will understand how they made that sales pitch. I, I don't get it. But somehow that is what modern feminists believe. And, and there were you know men in the, on the left that convince women that somehow this is a very healthy, empowering thing for them to do. I'll never understand that to my dying day. But if that is at the core of your belief system... 
you could see how a bunch of 11 year olds basically imitating sex on a stage for the enjoyment of middle aged men in the audience would be a very empowering thing. If that is your virtue, if doing whatever gets you attention and makes you feel as though you are, you know, the center of everybody's focus, if that is something that is empowering to you, if you think of that as empowering, then of course this movie would be feminist because it puts that front and center and it says, not only should women do this, they should do it at the youngest possible age, even before they are physically, emotionally, or mentally ready to engage in said activities that they are sort of emulating here. Uh, and then the, the other part of this is that when you're looking at this, the diversity statement, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because that's just sort of an afterthought, but when you were talking about how it's really important for black and brown people to see themselves on screen and to know that they can do anything, I don't have a problem with black actors and actresses, black characters, no issue with that whatsoever. Some of my favorite movies feature that. If you can only see yourself in a character in a story that happens to share your race, then you're a racist. I know that that's not comfortable. I know that that's not something that a lot of people are going to want to hear. But if you are only able to relate to or see yourself in the shoes of or aspire to be the person in a story that shares your race and you just can't see it with somebody outside of your race, then you're the racist. Also, it's really weird for her to act as though this is like the very first time that there's ever been a black person in a movie. Like, it's been going on for a really, really long time. This is not a recent development. If anything, if you look at the demographics, minorities, black people, Hispanics, are actually overrepresented in the movie industry, at least on screen. And so statistically, they actually have an overrepresentation. Now, I don't care. I'm fine with them being overrepresented. And for the towns that these movies are made in, you know, your Hollywood, your L.A.'s, it's probably a more accurate representation of the population as a whole than it is the American population, because, of course, other areas in the country are just simply not as diverse because they, you know, they're not all large urban centers on the West Coast, which is closer to other countries than the heartland, for example. And so that's perfectly OK. I don't have a problem with that, but I am a little annoyed by the, the idea. And, and this is something that the Oscars recently did, changing their parameters for, you know, you have to have a quota of a certain amount of people to be able to be considered for best picture, for example. I don't understand how they're acting as though this is some kind of thing that is still an issue that, you know, all of a sudden we just now have started having black people in movies. No, that's it's been going on for freaking ever. And if you are incapable of seeing yourself in the role of somebody that doesn't share your race, legitimately, you may be a racist because of that. I mean, there's lots of, of fantastic black characters in comic books that I really like, really relate to. Um, Luke Cage, for example. I really love Luke Cage. Out of all the Green Lanterns, the one that I relate to the most, the one that I like the most, the one that I think is the most heroic out of all of them is Jon Stewart who's a black guy and a former Marine. That guy kicks butt, and he's by far my favorite Green Lantern. It's not even close. Hal Jordan is a boar fest. <laughs> you see, that's the thing. There's a, there's a white Green Lantern and a black Green Lantern. I see a lot more of myself in and can relate more to the black Green Lantern because of his choices and the person he is, not because of the color of his skin. I didn't automatically gravitate to or relate to Hal Jordan just because he happens to be the white Green Lantern. I don't understand why people automatically think that that is the case. But to the greater point, sometimes satire really makes a point better than you could make through some kind of explanation. And the Babylon Bee does a fantastic job of this, and they have done so again. If you want a perfect illustration of why, even if this movie actually was a legitimate commentary, if it really was trying to say, look guys, hypersexualization of these little kids is bad, the Babylon Bee puts on display why that argument, even if it's correct, still does not excuse what cuties did. So you can check out this headline from the Babylon Bee. So Netflix movie murders puppies to teach that murdering puppies is bad. 
Uh, and the graphics they put together, their graphics department is fantastic. So you can see the little blurb about the movie. In this provocative film, the director just literally murders puppies to teach you that murdering puppies is bad. Powerful. And uh, it's one of those jokes that you do laugh at, but you kind of feel bad at laughing at because you're thinking about, ah, I mean, if that were real. The point that this satire is making, and yes, it is funny and we laugh at it, and, and should. It's a really good joke. The point that the satire is making, though, is if anybody saw that on Netflix, they would immediately go, well, I don't really care if it's a commentary on how bad it is to kill puppies is or not. It's not right for them to do it in the movie. Them trying to offer a commentary on what it should or shouldn't be doesn't justify the evil action that they take in the movie. That's the point here. A very provocative film, for example, that I'm a big fan of and literally promoted for free on my show, I might add, which, by the way, I'm also doing for Whataburger, so Whataburger, you know, I better be getting some free burgers out of this when you do come to town. But anyway, uh, when it came to the movie Unplanned, Unplanned, the, the movie about abortion that follows the story of Abby Johnson, if you haven't seen it, I highly, highly recommend it, but it is pretty raunchy. It's rated R, and rated R for a reason. A lot of conservatives had a problem with the rated R rating. Frankly, I thought it was appropriate. And that was a controversial opinion for me in conservative circles, but I said, look, guys, there's some scenes in there that I would not want somebody under the age of 17 watching. I think it's an important film. I think, frankly, you should take your teenagers to go see it, even despite the fact that parts of it are very graphic, but it displays what an abortion is. It shows you what it is, and it does spare the audience in some parts of showing some of the, the gruesome nature of it, but there are several points in that movie that it is sickening, it will turn your stomach, and it's because it is a commentary on the evil that is abortion. Here's the difference, though. They didn't perform an abortion on screen to illustrate why that is bad. The difference in this film with Cuties is they actually engaged in sexual exploitation and making the girls do provocative things in order to illustrate this. That's why it's wrong. Just having it on film to depict that is wrong in the case of Cuties. They only depicted it but didn't actually do it when it came to the movie about abortion. That's a completely different thing. They actually engaged in the sexual exploitation of these young actresses in order to make this film. That's the difference. Because when you have a cameraman, or camera woman, I don't know, but either way, it still wasn't right to do. When you have a grown cameraman taking a camera and having to zoom in on the crotch of an 11-year-old, which does happen in this movie, you have way crossed the line. You have gone so far past the line, the line is a dot to you at that point. Could they have done essentially exactly the same thing and shown how provocative that was without actually showing the footage on film itself? Sure. They could have had a picture of the little girl taking a picture of that with her cell phone, which is what that scene is depicting, but not actually show, and, and, and I know that this is disgusting and it's given me the willies just having to say this and think about it, but without having to show that taking place, without having to show the picture that she sent of, you know, her parts, and granted, there was underwear over it, but still, this is not something that's okay to, to show, obviously. Even if it, you know, you do have underwear on on top of it. All they would have had to do is show her, like, basically from, from the neck up and positioning the phone, clicking it, and talking about it. You don't have to show the actual thing on film. And that's what makes this so completely different, and that's the reason that this argument of, well, it's just a commentary, doesn't make any sense. It doesn't add up. They could have conveyed how wrong what they were doing is without actually showing them, showing off their bodies, dancing in these provocative ways, taking pictures of themselves, uh, the, the partial nudity parts of it. They could have done all of this without having to actually put that stuff on film. You don't have to do that to convey what was going on here. And so, frankly, it irritates me. And I hate even having to talk about this. I hate that we have gotten to a point in this world where I'm actually having to explain to a, probably a minority, but a portion of the population that showing this kind of stuff is not okay. 
the fact that we are here and having to have this conversation should be enough to enrage you. And I'm not somebody that tells you to give in to rage or to, you know, just be mad about it, not do anything about it. The fact that we are having to have this conversation irritates me to no end. I, I don't understand how we have gotten to this point in our society. Well, I say that. That's not, that's not entirely 100% too, true. I do understand it to a degree. I do understand it in the sense that the reason that we are here, the reason that we have reached this point, is because our society has completely neglected and forgotten God. And a recent survey showed that the average American spends, I kid you not, eight seconds reading a news story before either commenting on it or sharing it. That means that most people are barely finishing the headline before spouting out an opinion on content they didn't actually watch or read. Therefore, if you are watching this and made it to the end of this video, congratulations. You are, as Bernie Sanders would say, the 1%. So now it's totally appropriate to like and subscribe.